Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Kerfoot, and welcome to PNP Live. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this event in this new format. We are so excited that even though our stores are closed, we're still able to bring you authors and their new books. Um, and we really just want to support our community any way we can in this time. Um, this is, of course, a new venture for us, this digital format. So if you would just bear with us, we may have a few kinks to work out. Um, but we, we're getting more comfortable with this platform and um, just, just be patient with us. Uh, a few items before we begin. Um, at any time during this event, you can click the button right below you on the bottom of your screen. It's a green button. And that will let you purchase Jesse McWegman's book tonight. And it goes straight to the Politics and Prose website. Um, we are currently offering free shipping on all orders, no minimum. So your online purchase goes to support our small business in a time like this when we truly need it the most. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, we can't afford to keep putting on events like this if we don't see book sales in return. So we're really depending on you to support us with your purchase. And we hope you'll tell your friends about all of our upcoming events that we're doing in this format. Um, another thing to keep in mind, just like at all of our in-person events, you're able to ask the author a question tonight. If you click again near the bottom of your screen, you'll see it says ask a question. Um, and you can submit your question, you can read other people's questions, and we encourage you to vote for the questions that you want to see answered with the little up and down arrows that you'll see on that feature. Um, a reminder that unlike our in-person events, the author, host, and the rest of the audience cannot see you, so feel free to live life in your pajamas or your bathrobe without judgment. Uh, you will only be able to see people that are on your screen. And finally, we just really want to thank you for being here with us tonight. As you know, small businesses and especially independent bookstores are getting really hard right now with the spread of COVID and, and having to close our stores. So we just feel really lucky that we have such loyal customers here and we have so many of you on screen tonight and we just wanna say thanks from all of us at PNP. So without further ado, we'll get into our event. Jesse Wegman is our author tonight. He is a member of the New York Times editorial board where he has written about the Supreme Court and legal affairs since 2013. In his new book, he shows how we can at long last make every vote count in the United States and restore belief in our democratic system. Wegman is joined in conversation tonight by Adam Liptak, a New York Times writer who covers the United States Supreme Court and writes Sidebar, a column on legal developments. So please help me welcome Jesse Wegman and Adam Liptak onto your screens. Well, Jesse, it is a great pleasure to be with you to celebrate this really wonderful book. I had a little time on my hands over the past couple of days, so I read it with even more care than I ordinarily would have. And it, it's really a, a fantastic combination of deep scholarship and lively journalistic writing, very well presented through real human beings, and in a very fair-minded but relentless way, taking on all of the arguments pro and con, it makes the case for the abolition of the Electoral College. I think where I want to start, Jesse, just to make sure Sure has electoral college weird. Hillary won three million more popular votes than Trump did, but he won the electoral college. But walk through the structure of how it works, because I'm not sure everybody knows the particulars of how the electoral college works. Sure, uh, and thank you, Adam, and, and thank you, for politics and Perry, for doing this. Um, is there? I just want to make sure I apologize in advance for my appearance. I'm, I'm hiding away in a cabin. <laughs> as a refugee from New York City right now, and everything is still, uh, still getting everything under control. Um, are, are you hearing an echo? Because I'm getting a little one. The, the audio is not perfect. Okay. Uh, as long as there's no echo, then I'll, then I'll, uh, for the, for the uh, audience, then I'll keep going. Um, so the, the problem with the uh, electoral college, and, and I think one of the things that I was struck by in working on this book uh, was how little I knew about how the electoral college worked. You know, I went to college, I went to law school. Uh, these are things I feel like I could really understand. <laughs> uh, and so if I didn't understand them, I figured most people didn't. Um, and to break it down in its simplest form, the electoral college 
is really just a, it's a system of uh, giving states electoral votes uh, according to their representation in Congress, and those are the electors who actually select the president, not the the American public. It's the, the public's vote is essentially an advisory vote, um, and what happens is there is not you know this is one of the things that I think most people don't understand about the college. There isn't a single body of electors that exists in every state waiting to be told what to do. Each candidate brings his or her own slate of electors to the game. And they say, if, if that candidate wins the most votes in a state, all of those that candidate's electors go to the state capitol and cast their vote for that candidate. So let's I mean, let's bring two challenges. It's actually you, you, an argument I'd say in favor of a, a more straightforward uh, popular vote system. But but the bottom line is that candidates have their own electors. Electors are not what the founders said that they should be, which is these uh, uh, you know deliberative, thoughtful men sitting there and thinking who would be the best person to lead the country. They are partisan players who want their candidate elected. So you blew past the math a little bit quickly, and let's pause on that for a second. So is it is this a basic problem with the Electoral College, that if you're Wyoming, you have one representative of Congress, two senators, you get three votes. If you're California, you have, I don't know, 50 representatives and two senators. And does it matter much that the small states are getting that two-person bonus? It's interesting. That's one of the most common memes you see on Facebook or social media is people being upset about this idea that say Wyoming voters have more power than say California voters. So I'll answer that in two parts. First is true. Wyoming voters and also small state voters have relatively more power than voters in big states and that's because of the reason you said, which is every state gets two electors for its senator. And that those two electors give an obvious bump to people in smaller states where the population is much smaller. So Wyoming voter counts for something like close to four times what a California voter counts for. That's the first part of the answer. Yes, mathematically, it's true. The more important part of the answer is it doesn't matter. And that's because the much bigger distorting effect of the electoral college is not those two Senate electors but the winner take all rule, which 48 of the 50 states currently use to award their electors. And under that rule, the candidate who wins the most votes in the state actually wins all of their state electors, no matter how close or how not close the vote was in that state. When you start allocating electors in that way, it is a far more distorting and powerful impact on the outcome of the election than that little bump that the small states get because of those those two electors. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And these two things are different, right, Jesse? Because one of them is in the Constitution and one of them isn't. Exactly. Thank you for bringing me to that point. Um, the two senators, uh, the two electors that you get for your senators and all the electors that you get for your representatives is really the only thing about the electoral college that is in the Constitution. Everything else about how to run their electoral college votes is completely state made. How the electors are chosen? Are they done? Is it done by popular vote of the citizens of the state? Is it done by the state lawmaker? Is it done by the governor? It's really uh, you can do it any way you want. There are no limitations except this baseline constitutional prohibitions of equal protection. Mm -hmm. um, and then this issue of uh, allocation, which is uh, winner pay all, which is used in forty eight or uh, Two states, Maine and Nebraska, use something called the congressional district, district allocation, which is you give one elector for each congressional district that is won by one candidate or the other, and then those two senator based uh, electors go to the winner of the statewide vote. All of that is completely outside the Constitution. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing stopping states from adopting it or from switching to something else. So in your in your book, you make a powerful case that the geniuses who framed the Constitution may have uh, had a lapse in this particular regard. What were they thinking of? What was it, what were they what was the problem they were trying to solve with by having the Electoral College? And were there sort of contemporaneous reasons why it made more sense then than it does now? 
Sure. Uh, to answer that in, in two parts, I think that it's a good way to separate it. What were they thinking? <laughs> right. Um, they were thinking a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things they were thinking about was keeping the presidency separate from Congress. So there were some of the framers at the convention who said Congress should pick the president. You know, in some of the state legislatures, for instance, at the time, uh, the state lawmakers picked the governor. So that was a model that they had. It, I think the, that, that view locked out, that position locked out uh, because of a concern that a president selected by Congress would be dependent on Congress. So there were several of the top framers, including James Madison, James Wilson, uh, saying this is a terrible idea. At any cost, we have to keep Congress from being the body that's the president. So that's one thing we were worried about. Another one is obviously this issue, this other issue is the contemporaneous circumstances. The country, obviously, at the time, is much smaller than it is today. Virtually no one is allowed to vote other than white property to know. And there is no transportation or communication network to speak of, right? Those people are largely uneducated. They live in small towns and farmers. They don't, you know, there's a couple of cities, but they're tiny compared to what we think of today, you know, maybe 10, 20,000 people. And the framers were concerned that while people would know candidates for their local office, to say the House of Representatives, they wouldn't know national political candidates. They, just, they couldn't possibly get enough information about the people running to rule the country. So that, that factor, the factor of trying to keep it out of Congress, and then of course, the issue of slavery, which shot through the entire constitutional convention from beginning to end, influences every part of the shape of the Constitution. It's a conversation we've really been starting to have more in the last few decades, uh, thanks to some really uh, some pioneering scholars who kind of brought us back to understanding just how central slavery was and all of the deals that were made uh, in the Constitution and uh, sorry, at, the, at the convention. Um, that, that part of the story is more complicated, but um, in the book I tell several stories of where the founders are, are quite explicit, right there in the, in the middle of the convention saying, of course, you know, <laughs> of course we will do this in any other way, but uh, the slave states, so, so uh, sorry, let me give you a, one example of this, which is James Madison, uh, July 17th, which is about halfway through the convention, that the, the uh, Delegates have just agreed to um, adopt the shape of Congress that we know today, which is the House of Representatives and the Senate. Both of those deals were struck for the benefit of the southern states, right? The, the Senate gives all states equal power, and then uh, the House of Representatives has its infinite freedom clause, which gives the state, southern states even more power based on their slaves who are obviously not allowed to vote. So, in fact, James Madison, considered the father of the Constitution, agreed that a national popular vote for president is the fittest, he called it the fittest way to select a leader. And he effectively says that the southern states will never go for it, he says, on account of the Negro. Mm -hmm. So they were quite explicit at the time that slavery was a central factor in their decision about how to elect the president. Um, and so those three things together, I think, are really what they were considering and what they were trying to do get somebody in office who would be uh, the, the, the considered choice of people who actually understood who, um, who the best of leaders were. So correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but is, is there not another theme that runs through the framers thinking about uh, elections? They were a little distrustful of direct democracy. And this circuit breaker of having electors who at least some of them conceived of as prominent, wise people who would, you know, sort of guide the people's choices, um, would be kind of a circuit breaker between the mob and the president. Is there anything to be said for that point of view? Yes. Um, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to just, because I'm hearing this echo and it's quite distracting as I'm talking, I'm going to, while I speak, I'm just going to mute it and then I'll turn it back on and I'll stop. So forgive me if you, uh, try to break in and I, and I seem to ignore you. Um, so this question about the framers' discussion of democracy actually is a really interesting one and it's um, more complicated than I think a lot of people realize. There's a general assumption that 
the framers distrusted the people. There is some truth in that. You know, James Madison himself was uh, a fan of the, you know what he would call the successive filtrations of democracy, right? Multiple layers in which uh, the people's voice was um, filtered or translated through um, leaders with more knowledge or, or more uh, you know deliberative qualities. At the same time, think about what they actually did do at the Constitutional Convention. They adopted. Popular, direct popular vote for the House of Representatives, which at the time was considered to be uh, the, the most powerful branch of government. They decided to send the Constitution for ratification, not to state legislatures, which they could have done, but to the, state, to the people of the states themselves to be voted on in ratifying conventions. I mean, that's, that's a, those are pretty remarkable decisions to make for a group of men who supposedly don't trust the people or don't trust democracy. Now, that said, there's certainly plenty of examples of framers of the convention expressing extreme distrust of the people. Um, you know, Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts uh, said, you know, that they will, they're liable to be um, fooled by designing men. Um, no question that that was a, a, an element of a, a concern among many of the framers. But I really think that, you know, some of the most influential men at that convention, and including James Wilson, who is fascinating figure and I spend the entire first chapter talking about him because I was so taken with um, his the way he approached ideas of democracy and popular rule and, and, and the sovereignty of the people um, they really were in favor of a popular vote for president they didn't see any problem with it at all Governor Morris one of the most the most prolific speaker at the convention a, a Philadelphia delegate um, he was quite open about saying, of course the people should pick the president directly. So I think this, I, this story that we tell of the framers' distrust of democracy is a lot more complicated. And in the end, I don't think it was quite as central to their decision of how to elect the president as we like to think. So let's say you've convinced us that the Electoral College is a bad idea. Short of a constitutional amendment, which is all but inconceivable, although you write an interesting passage about how close we came, to getting a constitutional amendment. But but let's let's say you're right, we should get rid of it. Let's assume that no constitutional amendment is possible. Walk us through three solutions, and let's do it in this order, because two of them, my naive view, were the ones that came to mind, but they're not the ones you endorse. One of them you've described a little bit already. It's to do it by congressional district, plus the two senatorial votes would go to whoever won the whole state, which is what Maine and Nebraska do already. What's wrong with that system? Is, is that better than the current system? No, it might be worse. <laughs> um, remember, our congressional districts are drawn by state lawmakers. State lawmakers uh, have, for time immemorial, um, drawn uh, district lines to benefit themselves uh, and to benefit their own party. Uh, we call it gerrymandering, um, or probably gerrymandering, after Eldridge Gerry, uh, who drew a particularly um, a notorious one. Uh, and, uh, you know, as recently as last year, the Supreme Court uh, essentially uh, cleaned its hands of the matter and said, no matter how disproportionate or no, how unfairly these maps are drawn, no matter how biased they are in favor of one party or another, we don't have the constitutional authority or the constitutional tools to fix it. If you're basically on your own. Right now, those maps affect um, state and state state. Uh, legislatures and Congress and the, and the makeup of the House of Representatives. They don't touch the uh, Electoral College, they don't touch the way we elect the president, except in Maine and Nebraska, right, uh, which use that system, because all the states except Maine and Nebraska use one to take off. If you uh, adopted congressional district uh, allocation in all of the states, you would then be importing all of the unfairness and all of the bias of partisan gerrymandering, which is only, I think, going to get worse as the Supreme Court has stepped away from uh, being willing to uh, adjudicate it, into the election of the president. And then we would see all of those un unfairnesses basically mapped onto our election of the president in addition to the election of the House of Representatives. I can go on, but I wanted to stop and see if you wanted to pick in there. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so you've convinced me that that's, it's possible to make this terrible system even worse. What about the next thing that comes to mind? Uh, and again, the states would be free to adopt this. There's no constitutional bar. Simply doing proportional representation. So if Hillary Clinton wins 60% of the vote in California, 
she gets roughly 60% of the electors. What's wrong with that? It, it's really great, right? And it's one that people constantly throw at me. They say, okay, fine. You know, the electoral college is, uh, I, don't, I don't like moving with all either. So let's go to proportional. That seems fair. Okay. I agree with you. It sounds a lot fairer. And you just made the point. There's no constitutional bar to it. I would, I would, uh, I would qualify that somewhat. There is no constitutional bar to states using um, what I, what we call whole number proportional representation, right? Which is using the electors themselves and just saying um, if one candidate wins sixty percent and the other candidate wins forty percent in a state, you know, they get sixty percent of electors and forty percent of electors. Sure. The only problem is a lot of states don't break down nicely on the same lines that their popular vote breaks down in terms of how many electors they have. Certainly with most of the smaller states, um, or really any state with fewer than say 10 electors, you really start to run into problems of uh, accurate representation yeah. of the popular vote um, through uh, just whole number proportional allocation. So for just for example, um, let's take Wyoming again, right? Three electors. Let's say Wyoming's vote goes 52 to 48. Well, you only have two choices in Wyoming. You can give two electors to one candidate and one to the other, or three and zero. Neither of those comes close to representing a 52 to 48 outcome in the popular vote. So if your feeling is that, and, and, when, you, and when that happens nationally, you start to see the same distortions that you're seeing today just through a different mechanism. The way that would, proportional voting that would in fact be much more uh, close to a representation of the public will as expressed in the popular vote is what's called fractional proportional representation. That would mean that a state could use as many fractional points as it wanted to to allocate its electors. If a, if a candidate won um, you know, 62.38% of the vote, they would get 62.38% of the electors. Great, that does get us a lot closer to what I would call a popular vote election. However, electors are people, they're human beings, they can't be carved up into fractions. Therefore, you would have to amend the Constitution as it currently is written to uh, get us to a fractional proportional allocation. Okay, so before I turn to what I think you're going to say is the solution here, let me remind people of two things. There's a place at the bottom you can ask questions. We're going to turn to your questions soon. And there's a place at the bottom to buy books. And I think you're gradually being persuaded that you're going to want this book. Um, so what is the solution? What is the solution without a constitutional amendment where we still have the Electoral College, but we actually let the people pick the president? How do you do it? Well, I think this gets at uh, something we just mentioned uh, a moment ago, which is that either of those prior uh, ideas or proposals, uh, congressional district allocation or um, whole number of proportional allocation, could be done um, without amending the Constitution. That's true. However, Neither of them would be done because states will never agree to do something like that unilaterally. Realistically, the only way that states are going to do this is if they all were forced to do it together. Uh, and that is why, even under those circumstances, though you don't need a constitutional amendment to do them, you would effectively need a constitutional amendment because the states aren't going to unilaterally give up the power that they have by choosing winner take the state winner take all rule as 48 states currently do. The reason that state winner take all rule is so powerful and the reason that so many states ran to it in the early years of our uh, nation is that it gives them an immense amount of clout to say to the preferred candidate, their preferred party candidate, we're going to give you, we can give you all of our electors, right? Not just half of our electors or some fraction of our electors, but all of our electors. So this is just something, sorry, before I get to the, the, the magic solution, um, this is something that at the beginning of the country, states were practicing with all these different forms, right? They were trying out all kinds of different mechanisms for awarding their electors. Some gave them, the lawmakers did it themselves, they didn't include the, the people at all. People have, we, we have no right at all to uh, vote for president or vote, even vote for electors. It's completely up to the state lawmakers. Some states did allow for popular votes, some had the governor do it. They tried all different things. Within a few years, they all realized very fast that the that what gave them the most power as a state was to use winner, the state winner take all. That realization is, I think, what still lives on today and what led to the, I think, brainchild 
of uh, of a computer scientist in California named John Rosa, whom I write about at length in this book, uh, and his creation, which is called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And basically, what that compact does is the compact is an agreement among states, and what it does is it allows the states, it, the states that join the compact, agree to give all of their electoral votes not to the winner of their state vote as they do today, but to the winner of the national popular vote. And the compact only goes into effect. States representing a majority of votes, 270, agree to it. Once that happens, if you do the math, you realize that the person, the candidate who wins the most popular vote in the country automatically becomes the president. I can say more about it, but I've already said a lot, so if you have any questions. Uh, no, do say a little bit more about it, because this is not a pipe dream. This is sort of underway, right? So the, so the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact uh, started in 2005. I think that's when they uh, finalized the plan. Um, and uh, it was adopted in its first, it, it got its first state member in 2007 when Maryland joined. It now has 15 states in the District of Columbia as members, representing 196 electoral votes. Remember, remember what I said. They need 170. That means they're 74 votes away. They're more than two thirds of the way there to actually this compact kicking in and taking effect. So the, the main issue I think here is, and I, go, I speak about this in the book, is that all the states so far that have adopted 15 states in the District of Columbia are all um, led by Democrats, not Democratic majorities. That looks bad on the surface. Um, I really don't think, um, you know, as much as I support this movement, as much as I support a popular vote for president, I don't think it's the wisest way to get there to make it look like a partisan effort. Here's the rub. In fact, the popular vote compact movement is run by Republicans and Democrats together. It has, it has Trump supporting Republicans and very liberal Democrats working together to achieve a popular vote for president. And they actually made a lot of headway in Republican led states all over the country. Um, they have passed it in four Republican-led chambers in the country. And in 2016, before the election of 2016, three Republican-led states, what I'm refusing to call red states because I hate the term red states, blue states, um, three Republican-led states were on the verge of passing the contract themselves. And the election kind of blew the whole thing out of the water. Everyone ran back to their partisan corners. And it definitely helped us set back to the effort uh, for several years. Yeah, so, so, Jesse, who knows who, which party would benefit in the long run? And over time, it's probably good for Democrats some years, good for Republicans some years. But in the current climate, it's probably good for Democrats, no? I, I have to say, um, in one sense, you know, I can hear people saying, oh, come on, of course the Democrats are going to win. Uh, people have short memories. You know, yes, uh, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million votes. Um, Barack Obama won by, I think, 5 million or more his first time around. Um, yes, de Democrats have done well in the popular vote in recent years. Let's remember two things. First of all, it wasn't so long ago that a Republican won the popular vote walking away. You know, George W. Bush in 2004 won the popular vote by 3 million votes, the same number that Hillary Clinton won by just in 2016. Um, if you add up all of the popular votes throughout the last 80 years of presidential elections, so like 1.5 billion votes, you find that the difference between votes for Republicans and votes for Democrats is minuscule. It's about 700,000 votes. It's essentially a dead heat over the course of a, over the long run. And that just reveals the basic fact that parties are always changing and adapting to the circumstances around them. Now, I will say, if the Republican Party continues down the path that it has been in the last few years, a, a sort of a Trumpist party um, that really that really appeals to white grievances and, and sort of a, a, an ever an ever decreasing slice of the electorate, right? Older um, and, and more conservative white people and white non college edu educated men in particular. Yes, I think you probably will see that Democrats have a benefit, a bonus in the college. But if you move to a popular vote, the whole calculus gets scrambled, and I think in ways that people don't necessarily predict. I think you would really see the parties both forced to change the way they campaign and change the way they appeal to voters and change the policies they adopt in order to win more votes. Mm -hmm. And it would result in a nationwide campaign. We wouldn't have, you know, six or eight battleground states or fewer essentially deciding the election so that 
someone like you lives in New York, someone like me lives in DC, it's sort of pointless to vote. We know who's going to get the electoral votes in our jurisdictions. Doesn't that intimidate you? I mean, like, it, it drives me crazy. I mean, and I, and, and I feel, you know, empathy for Republicans in California who vote also don't matter. And, and I feel, you know, I feel it, it's, it feels like just like a, a fundamental um, erosion of basic democratic uh, governance to have an election for the office of the person who's supposed to run the entire country would be decided by a few thousand or a few hundred thousand of voters, or as in the case of 2,000, a few hundred voters, right? For a, for a race in which we have 120, 140 million people casting a ballot. So this is really where the rubber meets the road in this story, which is that it's not just about the lofty principles of one person, one vote, or majority rule, which definitely to me are, are central to this whole story, and I spend whole chapters talking about them. It's really about what the impact of a non-popular vote election, and in particular an electoral college election run under statewide winner take all rules, does to distort um, the, the way that campaigns uh, run their campaigns, the way that presidents govern, the way that candidates try to appeal to voters. And so as you said, six to eight you know, uh, battleground states are really where the whole game is played. The rest of us are just spectators, basically. And as a result, the candidates don't care what we care about. The candidates care what the people in this year, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, care about, right? Now, I'm not saying that that the concerns of the people in those states don't matter. Of course they matter. But they don't matter more than my concerns in New York, or your concerns in Washington, or someone else's concerns in Idaho. But as a result of the way our system works today, that's, that's, how, it, that, that's how it plays out. And a popular vote forces candidates to reach out to the entire country, uh, listen to what the entire country is saying, and basically develop a, a platform and a government strategy based on that. So, Jesse, I have a ton more questions for you, but uh, let's turn to some audience questions now, and then we'll see if I have a chance to come back to them. Let's see if I can make this work. Thank you very much for submitting questions. Um, here's the first one. Um, Article 1, Section 10 says, no state, oh, this is a question I was going to ask. Thank you, Jerome Heavey. Uh, Article 1, Section 10 says that no state shall, without the consent of Congress, enter in, into any agreement or compact with another state. Has this been discussed in connection with the proposed interstate compact? After all, the solution you're talking about is called the National Popular Vote Compact. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Heavey. Excellent question, and I'm eager to have Jesse's answer. It's a great question. Um, it is a uh, central challenge to the compact that has been raised, and it will certainly be a matter that will be, that will be litigated if the compact is effect. So I have two answers to that. Um, the first is the compact authors are, are well aware of that uh, clause in the Constitution and um, believe, as a matter of the suspenders approach, uh, that it is wise to try to obtain the consent of Congress. That said, they are very confident and I am inclined to agree with them as a pure legal matter, not as a political matter, but as a pure legal matter, that they do not need consent of Congress. Now, let me explain why. That, that clause that you just read, Article 1, Section 10, it does very explicitly say uh, compacts require the consent of Congress. However, for more than 100 years now, the Supreme Court has very clearly interpreted that clause to mean states need some, some, some compacts need consent, not all compacts. The compacts that need consent are compacts that infringe in some way on federal sovereignty, federal authority, federal power. If a compact doesn't infringe, say for example, uh, two, um, two states uh, making an agreement over uh, like a water rights uh, that, for, for a body of water that they share, or say for example, uh, an interstate lottery, um, in, in, that, in, that, in, in that kind of setting, and there are Dozens and dozens and dozens of compacts, interstate compacts that do not infringe on federal sovereignty, federal authority. No consent is needed. The Supreme Court has been crystal clear about this. They've said it over and over again. The argument of the compact authors is because the decision of how to allocate electors is purely a state decision in the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution. The states may allocate their electors in, what, in whatever manner the state's legislature chooses. I'm not, uh, that's not a verbatim quote, but that's, uh, that's the essence of the 
of the clause in the Constitution. Because it is purely a state power, there is no federal authority at all in the choosing of how states allocate their electors. The argument that, of the, that the compact's founders make is we are not infringing on any federal authority because there is no federal authority in this, in this uh, arena. So in, in gentle rejoinder, what you say makes a great deal of sense, but it seems to be in some tension with the actual words of the Constitution. And while nobody doubts that you could individually, unilaterally uh, allocate your votes to the popular vote winner, making a deal among the states is a little different in kind. And I'd like to ask you one follow-up question on that. Um, is this a one-way ratchet? Once the state legislature signs onto the compact, is it allowed to unsign it from, from, from the compact? Can it change its mind? Or yeah, the compact's own terms, like almost all compacts and all contracts terms, uh, do allow for withdrawal. Um, to be clear, an interstate compact is a contract. It basically follows basic, it follows basic contractual rules, um, and uh, there are arguments that it's uh, that its terms are, are protected under the contract clause of the Constitution, which is different from the compact clause of the Constitution. I don't want to get too confusing here, um, but uh, the states may withdraw, but there is something called a blackout period, which is also a common uh, feature of many contracts. Um, between July 20th of, the, of an election year and January 20th of the following year, which is also we call Inauguration Day, no state that is a member of the compact could, can withdraw. So the idea there is basically any state that might be getting cold feet about this and thinking, uh-oh, uh, we signed on to this compact 10 years ago, but now it's looking like it may lead to a result that our party leadership in the state doesn't want. Um, they won't be able to back out uh, before the election. Uh, they can do it right after on January 21st, but they can't do it in that blackout period. The only thing I wonder about is there's a, a proposition that to, to do with Congress, but probably true of state legislatures too, is that one Congress can't bind the next one. And this in a sense, if passed, you know, 10 years ago in Colorado, which I think was first, um, can that continue to bind today's lawmakers in Colorado who may have a different view, or is this blackout period something that the earlier state legislature can impose on the later one? I mean, my understanding is that uh, blackout periods are a totally different part of contract, and that they can that, that, that they are binding, uh, and that if you want to withdraw from the contract, you certainly can. But that the blackout period applies until it doesn't apply. So, I mean, it's a six-month period. It's very, it's an isolated period. It just applies to the moment at which, say, uh, a partisan interest might interfere with uh, the, the functioning of the combat. All right, let's next step. Let's see what the next one. Let's see what the next one is. Has proportional allocation of electoral college representatives ever been considered? So here's a fascinating uh, uh, part of the history that I didn't know before I started working on this book. There have been more than 700 attempts in Congress to amend or abolish the Electoral College since the founding era. Starting in 1797, like 10 years after the Constitutional Convention, people have been trying to mess with this thing or get rid of it for 230 plus years. Far more, 700 attempts is far more than for any other provision of the Constitution. This is clearly the thing that upsets people more than anything else, now that the 55th Clause is gone, about the Constitution. Um, proportional allocation is uh, something that has come up many times in Congress, and in fact, it actually, a, 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 a constitutional amendment requiring proportional allocation, again, a whole number allocation, a constitutional amendment requiring proportional allocation passed the Senate in 1950, uh, and then it died in the House. Um, so, yes, it has been, it, it has been uh, proposed, it has got as far as passing uh, one House of Congress, um, but it, uh, it, it has never gotten any further than that. All right, let's see who's next. Thank you for that question. Um, that was from uh, David McCullough. Um, next question from Claire Jerry. Why would this system result in a national campaign? Why would it not just shift battleground states to the majority population states? Very good question. Why doesn't everyone just campaign in New York and Texas and California? That's where the votes are. You know, I hear that um, question a lot or that challenge quite often. Um, you know, when I see it on places like what you see is like, um, uh, I'm not saying that 
this is a question coming from uh, uh, this questioner, but you see sometimes a map that shows California and New York looking like they take up 80% of the country. Um, there is some misunderstanding just about the sheer size of, of big cities in this country and, and, and big states. Um, they, they aren't anywhere near as big relative to the population of the whole country as people like to, to imagine. Um, but just to, I think a, a slightly more nuanced point on this is, let's take a look. If you want to think about how would campaigns actually run their campaigns, you have to look at the closest proxy we have right now to how that would happen, which is battleground state elections in presidential years. Now let's look at what are the two features of a battleground state election. Every vote in the state matters. They are all equal, and the candidate who wins the most votes wins that state. Right? That is basically a proxy for a national popular vote in the sense that a national popular vote is also an election in which every vote matters equally, and the candidate who wins the most wins. So, what do candidates do in battleground state in the battleground states during election years? The answer, and this is really fascinating, this is research that's been done by the um, Popular Vote uh, Compact team. Uh, and what they did is they looked at where campaigns spent their time and their money in battleground states in election years. And what you find, and it's really amazing, and this pattern holds across battleground state after battleground state, is that they go, they go to all parts of the state. They visit every part of the state, they visit the cities, they visit the rural areas, they visit the suburbs, they visit the exurbs, they visit the small towns, and they visit them in proportion to the number of people that are there. So I just want to be clear, this is a different, it's, that's a different, the fact that they go more to the city is a different thing than saying, well, why would the candidate, why wouldn't the candidate just spend all their time sucking up votes in New York and California? First of all, there just aren't enough votes in those places to win a national election. But second of all, Anybody who runs a campaign like this will tell you, of course, it's campaigning 101. When you have to win as many votes as possible and all the votes matter, you go everywhere. Even if you know you're going to lose an area, you at least want to lose that area by less. Okay. Let's see what's next. In 2016, this is from Solomon. In 2016, Hillary Clinton outperformed Obama's 2012 vote in the Northeast. This could be attributed to high, higher turnout among the West. Would the contract clause turn out races as opposed to appealing to the center, not that this is bad or good? Sorry, I think I didn't quite understand the yeah, question. Yeah, I'm having a tiny bit of a hard time parsing it, and I'm sure it's our fault, not the questioners, but let me, let me read it one more time. So in 2016, Hillary Clinton outperformed Obama's 2012 vote in the Northeast. This could be attributed to higher turnout on the left. Would the compact clause turn out races as opposed to appealing to the center, not that this is bad or good? Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe let me reformulate it. I hope I catch the essence of it. Assuming a national popular vote, would people tend to moderate or, 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 or move to the left and the right? Okay, I think that's actually a great question, and I think I understand it now. Um, I think here's one of the cool, for me, one of the most fun parts of the book. All of, every part of the book was really fun for me to work on. But one of the most fun parts is chapter nine, the last chapter of the book, in which I actually spend time speaking to dozens of campaign managers, field directors, ground game coordinators, both Republican and Democratic presidential campaigns for the last 20, 25 years. And what was fascinating to me was to hear how much more they would prefer to have a popular vote for president than the system that we have now. This, this held across both, with, with, with one or two exceptions, it held across both Republican and Democratic um, campaigners. And the, the reasons that they gave were, first of all, it's simply not right to run a national election in which basically uh, only one out of nine voters matter. Um, but also, the benefits, the, the concrete benefits of holding a popular vote election are that, A, you get more people turning out, right? Because it's a very simple calculus. When people vote matters, they vote, right? You see this every four years in battleground states, more people vote, uh, you know, than, by a good number, more people vote than in non battle states, safe states, as we call them. And the other real benefit that you see is political moderation. 
Now, this isn't to say that everything just becomes squishy centrist politics. What it means is that when you have lots more people coming out to vote, you could be talking 10, 20, 30 million more voters coming out if voting across the country matched what it currently does in battleground states. When you have that many more people voting, which means the candidate who wins the election would have to win close to 100 million votes, right? Right now, um, Donald Trump is president with 63 million votes. Uh, even Barack Obama was only president with a few more than that. If you had to win 100 million votes, I think by definition, you're talking about reaching out to a large enough swath of the population that by definition, you have to take positions that are more, um, I won't call them centrist, but I will say moderate and appeal to a broader coalition of people. And, and I think for me, that's something that right now, especially in this polarized moment, is a good thing. And let me say, apropos of that, uh, what, the, the book is so good because it combines historical research, uh, political theory, but also a lot of reporting about actual practical people. You know, we get Karl Rove's views on how, how elections actually work in, in the current system under this proposed new system, a whole variety of things. And Jesse really interrogates them and, and makes this case. All right, next question. You wonderful folks at Politics and Prose probably will there be draft copies available for purchase? If so, how do we purchase them? Sorry, Adam, I missed what you said there. Can you repeat? Yeah, the question, Jesse, is people would like to have autographed copies. Are you in a position to help them? I I think you said you could get an autographed copy. I would be happy to try to figure out the logistics for that. Um, I am uh, deep in the wilderness of, of Massachusetts right now, so I don't even know how to buy milk at the moment, but I would be happy to work with them to figure that out. Well, I, I, I guess in politics and prose will work on that, maybe we'll have book plates or something, but I'm sure that's something uh, they will try to accommodate. Uh, and this seems to be the last question at the moment, although I have one question of my own. Will the decennial census this year impact the discussion around the Electoral College? Sorry, Adam. It's taking the census. How does the census affect this stuff? Did the, the census? The census. Oh, the census. Like with Wilbur oh, Ross, the, the census. census. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so a whole other story. Uh, it's a great question. Um, obviously, uh, the census is such a central component of our uh, representative democracy. Right? It's the very first law that, that Congress has given in the Constitution. Uh, and uh, we are watching right now to see how it can get politicized and that can alter the outcome of, of, uh, of, of, of how maps are drawn and who's counted. Um, here's, let, me, let me come at that at a slight angle. The, this is an argument that I make in the book, and it's an argument that I've made on the editorial page, and it's an argument that I'm going to keep making because I think it's in some ways as important as the Electoral College. The House of Representatives is just too small. Uh, it is still 435 members, which it was in 1911, uh, was the last time it grew. So the country is triple the size that it was in 1911, and yet we still have the same number of uh, electors. Um, I'm sorry, of, of representatives in the House. Now, the reason that this matters is, uh, first of all, just in terms of sheer representation issues for the states, uh, right? That you can imagine which states are actually suffering because there aren't enough uh, representatives to go around. Um, and I have an editorial, if you want to look at it, from 2018 called America Needs a Bigger House, in which I make the really uh, I, I, the, the fleshed out case for, for how and why we need a bigger house. The way that this affects the Electoral College, of course, is that electoral votes are allocated on the basis of the states and the Constitution on the basis of how many representatives you have in the House, uh, right, plus your two senators. If a state like California has 53 uh, House representatives in the House, it gets 53 electors of those representatives. Just to show you how worked this is, California, I think, has grown by something like 2 million residents in the last, since the last census in 2010, okay? California is going to most likely lose seats next year. That's how warped uh, it is to have to work with such, such a small uh, House of Representatives. So to the extent that, I mean, obviously the census itself can't, can't affect the, the, the 
of the uh, the number of in, in uh, the House of Representatives. But I'm just I'm just agree. I want to agree that uh, with the, with the questioner that this is a it's you're right to tie those things together, and it's a hugely important component of how we elect our president. All right, we're coming up on eight o'clock, so I'm going to ask what that last question just disappeared. Um, I'm, then I'm going to ask my own last question. Uh, Jesse, we, uh, we in April, unless the court calls off the arguments, which it may well, are about to hear a case uh, at the Supreme Court about faithless electors. What's, what's the right answer to that question? Can someone who's named as an elector vote differently than he or she pledged to vote uh, when, uh, when, when they, they took on the job? It's a great question. Uh, we're going to find out whether or not there are other arguments in the case. Um, so here's, let me get this right back to the very beginning um, uh, of our discussion, which is, I, I am, and I don't know how many people agree with me on this, I really am under the feeling that it's not going to make a difference however the court decides. Mm -hmm. I think you can make a pretty decent argument uh, on the law uh, in the direction of um, saying that electors are free to vote their conscience, right? Clearly, all the contemporaneous evidence we have from the founding era suggests that this is how the framers thought electors should work. That's on the one side, right? You could see a 9-0 vote from the court for that. Then we have, or 8-0, I guess, because uh, Justice Sotomayor is recused. <laughs> but then you have, uh, on the other side, the Electoral College has never actually worked this way, right? The Electoral mm -hmm. College has always been a state party animal, OK? It has been uh, it has been a function of the partisanship of the states and of the leader the, the party leaders in those states, and so when you actually look at how electors have worked, they have o virtually always, with a very very small smattering of, of exceptions, been people who were, were rubber stamps for their party's candidate. That's why it's just it was remarkable to see faithful electors because they're so rare. No faithless elector has ever altered the outcome of an election, right. and I would wager a lot of money that no faithless elector ever will. So I know there was a lot of concern when that when those cases were accepted at the court uh, recently uh, about, oh my God, we've, we've changed the, the, the way that we elect our president, and one elector could basically just go rogue and say, I don't care what the people in my state did, I'm voting for someone else. I just don't think it's going to happen. Right. Electors want to vote for their candidate. Whether, however, however they get there, when they're sent to the state capitol, they want their candidate to win. They were chosen because they are a dedicated party member. They're chosen by local party officials in their county or in their, in their city or in their town. And they want to do that, right? Bill Clinton was an elector in 2016. Bill Clinton was kind of cast his ballot for someone other than Hillary Clinton. Uh, so I, I guess I just, I'm not terribly concerned about um, whichever way that, uh, that comes out, and I really could see it coming out either way. All right, this has been quite a stimulating discussion. We've really only skimmed the surface of this fascinating topic. I urge you to buy Jesse's book. I urge you to support politics and prose. I urge you to support independent bookstores. I urge you to stay safe, and I think we'll have a final word from, uh, from Brittany at Politics and Prose. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much to Adam and Jesse. I know we had a few technical difficulties there with sound, but I think overall the message came across and this is such an important message in an election year. Um, so I really hope you guys will will purchase Jesse's book with the link below. Remember, you get free shipping from Politics and Prose. Um, and we have some other events coming up in the next few days. Um, tomorrow at 7 p.m. right here on Crowdcast, we have Alex Halberstadt for his his book, Young Heroes of the Soviet Union. Um, and then on Saturday at 3.30, we have Robert Bryce for A Question of Power. And at 6, Anne Case and Angus Deaton will discuss the book, Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. So if you follow Politics and Prose on Crowdcast, there's a green button up near the top of your screen. You can get updates on all the events we're doing. Um, check out our web calendar and Stay well, stay well read. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Night. Thank you.